out in the highways and byways of life. Many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Make me a blessing. Out of my life, may Jesus shine. May On the second. <laughs> now, if you if you if you didn't catch it, now we, we hadn't sung this in a while, but down in the chorus, it splits between the men and women. So, women, y'all sing out, okay? On the second, tell the sweet story of Christ and His love. Tell of His power to forgive. Others will. Trust him if only you prove true every moment you live. Make me a blessing. Out of Jesus shine make me a blessing I pray thee my Savior make me a blessing to given to you in your need. Love as the master loved you. Be to the helpless a helper indeed. Unto your mission be true. Out of my life, may Jesus shine, make me a blessing. I pray thee, my Savior, make me a blessing to Jeff Hart, would you lead us in prayer, please? God help us. Amen. You may be seated. Have a few announcements. Remember, on March the 27th, Sunday at 6. Our missionary Daniel Norton will be with us, so try and make it back then. 
March the 28th through the 31st, the Bible Baptist Jubilee at the Ringgold Colonnade. Um, April the 2nd, Saturday at 8, will be our men's prayer breakfast. We'll be having a chainsaw training. No, my wife is not going to be heading that up. My wife does own two chainsaws. And a tractor. And assorted other things. <clears throat> On April the 7th, Thursday at 6.30, our ladies, ladies meeting will be in the fellowship hall. In special prayer, continue to remember Johnny Bradford, Peggy Bray, Carol Elkins, Don Moreland, who's in rehab, and Miss Diane Muck Buckner. Uh, any other announcement that we need to make at this time? Amen. Praise God. That's great. That's great. Anything else? If not, then turn to number 351 in that same book. Number 351. The Old Time Religion, number 351. Makes me love everybody, makes me love everybody. It's good enough for me. Tis the old time religion, tis the old time religion, tis the old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for our mothers, it was good for our mothers, it was good for our mothers. It's good enough for me, tis the old time religion, tis the old time religion, tis the old time religion, it's good enough for me. It was good for our fathers, it was good for our fathers, it was good for our fathers, it's good enough for me. Tis the old time religion, tis the old time religion, tis the old time religion, it's good enough for me. It will do when I am dying, it will do when I am dying, it will do when I'm dying, it's good enough for me. Tis the old time religion, tis the old time religion, tis the old time religion, it's good enough for me. It will take us all to heaven, it will take us all to heaven, it will take us all to heaven, it's good enough for me. Tis the old time religion, tis the old time religion, tis the old time religion, it's good enough for me. Number 235, if you would, turn to number 235. He set me free, number 235. Once like a bird in prison I dwelt no freedom from my sorrow I felt But Jesus came and listened to me And glory to God, He set me free He set me free, He set me free He broke the bonds of prison for me I'm glory bound my Jesus to see for glory to God, he set me free. Now I am climbing higher each day. Darkness of mine has drifted away. 
My feet are planted on higher ground And glory to God, I'm homeward bound He set me free, He set me free He broke the bonds of prison for me I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see For glory to God, He set me free Goodbye to sin and things that confound Darkness, world shall turn me around Daily I'm working, I'm praying to And glory to God, I'm going through He set me free, He set me free He broke the bonds of prison for me I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see, for glory to God, He set me free. If you would, let's all stand and greet our neighbor tonight. Amen. It's good to see y'all here. Good to be saved. Amen. You can be seated. Brother Chris, how long are y'all staying? Tuesday. Till Tuesday. No wonder why you're still smiling. Good to have you. Good to have Brother DeRussia and his wife here. Missionaries. Good to see them still being faithful, still hanging in. Well, it's good to know that there's some men of God that's real enough to hang in till the end. Amen. Amen. All right. I need two of my ushers to come forward. We'll go ahead and take up our evening offering. Good to have Brother Johnny here. I mentioned him this morning, so he decided to come. He's one of them people you got a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Aiden, go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for allowing us to come back to church tonight, Lord. Yes. Bless the message. Bless the singing, Lord, that we're not going to be approaching. Bless this offering. And love you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you.
Well, I said it before, but I'm proud of our young people. Us older ones got to get up there and make them look good. Now, they might outsing us, but they don't outlook us. <laughs> Amen. Come on, Miss Terry. Got a special singing. Y'all, honest to goodness, when your young people sing, get in there with them. Get in there. Because I'm telling you, what the devil's doing is getting the world to get in there with them. And then the church, ought to, when, when the young people do something for the Lord, man, you ought to get in there with them. You ought to let them know that they're doing right. You ought to amen them. You ought to, you ought to, you ought to tell them they do a good job. You ought to listen. You ought to, you ought to shout when there's a good part in it. Whether they get it or right or wrong, there's good words in them songs. And y'all ought to back them up while they're singing the old songs of Zion. Come on, Mr. Terry, have a God's children too long have been burdened. They are longing for heaven's great shore, where heartaches are left far behind them. And burdens are carried no more. Come morning, I walk by the river. I rest neath the evergreen tree. So I'll carry through the midnight come morning there's glory for me sometimes I'm despised and rejected and I wonder oh father how long then I take one more look at Mount Calvary and it gives me the strength to go on come morning I walk by the river evergreen tree so I'll carry my cross through the midnight come morning there's glory for me come morning I walk by the river I'll rest neath the evergreen tree so I'll carry my cross through the midnight come morning there's glory for me
Ephesians chapter 6, in this life, no, you ain't got to turn to it. We ain't there. Our clothing is warrior clothing. We change that out in Revelation 19 as a bridal ground. But here in this life, it's a fight. It's being wounded. It's a burden. The next life is where we get the glory. Amen. Amen. And you say, brother, preacher, you say that kind of stuff a lot. I don't want you to think that just because you're saved that you're going to walk in roses the rest of your life and you're going to get little gold dust handed down to you from heaven every time you turn around. Your blessings in this life are spiritual. They're not physical. They can be. But God's wanting to bless you spiritually. Thank God. Next life is where we get all the whole package. And so I just want you all to know that, man, we're here, for a, we're here for a reason. And I've asked Brother David to be ready tonight in case I didn't feel exactly right and my voice was losing. And so he's going to preach tonight. But I, I, I said this back there in the prayer room, and I want to tell all y'all. I think it's been probably about six months since we've had somebody saved. Now, I don't know if y'all noticed that, but that, it bothers me. As your pastor, that bothers me. And I told them back there that I know there's seasons. There's time for growing. There's time for planning. There's time that you got to sit back and let the seed that you put in the ground and, and the watering take place. I know that. And, so, and, and then there comes a harvest time. I realize that. But I've seen churches get used yeah. to seeing nobody get saved. And their burden for lost souls then wane. And they don't try to win nobody to the Lord. And I don't want you all to get into a place to where you're not seeing lost people. Y'all, the whole time Jesus was here, it was He did heal people. He did help people. He did go by and strengthen people. He gave people a place to rest. But I'm telling you, He came to seek and to save those that were lost. And now we're the ambassadors for Christ to seek and to save those that are lost. And so yes, we might be in a time of planting seeds. But that's because we got a burden for the lost. Don't lose the burden. Don't get used to seeing nobody get saved. If all you want... I'm trying to say this right. If all you want is the good things of God, the blessings of God, if all you want, boy, this is going to be touchy, Brother DeRussia, when I say this, is God Himself, but you don't desire to see nobody saved, you're seeking the wrong God. God is going to put it on every single one of His, our God. The Lord God is going to put it on our hearts, burden us to desire to see somebody saved. And so many times we get caught up in all these side things, which are good, but we're trading out the most thing that God wants and that's to see soul saved. Soul saved. Okay, Brother David, come and preach. I asked him tonight, this is, I'm going to say this for y'all preachers. I know Brother Dwayne's outside, Brother Chuck's sitting here, and then Brother Tim's sitting here. I ask my preachers sometimes to be ready, and then I don't even use them. Um, and then sometimes like tonight, and he said it, he says, can I go ahead and say it? He said, 
Brother, that, that really bothers me. That really worries me. How'd you say that? I said, I'm afraid that what if I'm the wrong one or something. I walked up to him tonight because I got a message. And I'm not going to say I hit it right every time neither. There ain't no preacher hits it, hits it right every time neither, but I told him to be ready. But I walked up to him and I said, you got a burden? And he's like, uh. And I said, hey, my pastor used to do this to me. To train me. At the time, I didn't understand it. But he'd walk up to me and say, you got a burden? And I'd say, I knew he was talking about it. He's talking about a message. And I was like, uh, well, preacher, I got a message. And he, says, he said, I got a message. I said, that ain't what I asked you. I said, you got, do you feel like God's gave you something that the church needs? And he said, well, brother, what if I miss it? That's making me feel uneasy. I said, do you understand that we are preaching a message from the throne room of God, yeah. not from our mind? Yeah. I said, is God giving you something? Because there's a difference. Yeah. I, now, I, I'm trying to train my preachers when I say that. Yeah. And so he said, he finally said, what if I miss it? I said, by faith, do you feel like you got a message? And he said, yeah, I do. I said, that's what I needed to hear. Brother David, preach. I always feel like no matter what, March the 20th, 2022 on a Sunday night, it's not just a routine. Anytime the Bible is open and the gospel is preached, it, it's not routine. Right. You know, the Lord said his word wouldn't return void. So I take it seriously. And uh, when he came up and asked me that, and then he said, he's got one, if, but do I have one? And I started doubting a little bit because I want to make sure that the Lord is in it. He was talking about uh, not having souls saved. I remember, several, it's been several years ago, Brother Billy Wallace preached a message. He, most un, one of the most unusual messages I ever heard, but he titled it, he said, we need a baby. And everybody kind of chuckled when he started it, but then he started preaching about that it had been a long time since anybody had been saved in the church. Amen. Just talking about a baby Christian and what it does yeah. for the church. Right. The zeal, the excitement, the tenderness, the yes, sensitivity. Sir. And he said, you know, we get used to things and we, we forget what it's like to have a baby around. And uh, I never forgot that, but we do. You're right, brother. We get used to not seeing souls saved. And we do need baby Christians here. I want to say two things about the singing. Miss um, Terry, I love that song because, you know, I got to thinking she was singing about, about heaven come morning, we'll walk by the river. And there's not uh, many, there's not much talk anymore about heaven. There's not many songs sung anymore about heaven. And I appreciate that because I think what it is is we are... Um, we're just so comfortable here, you know, we want things to go well here because we like our life here and we don't think much about heaven anymore. And, um, but I love to hear songs about heaven. I still love to hear those old ones like Sweet Beulah Land. Yeah, me too. And, um, but also the young adult, the youth choir. Um, years ago, this church had a, a very successful, I guess that's the best word I can say it, it they were called the Sounds of Calvary. And it was a large group. They, they filled, well, we didn't have this platform, but I mean, there, Jackie, you would know. Y'all probably had at least 20 in there, didn't you? And um, they made a record back when there was records, you know. They made maybe more than one. I don't know, but they, they made two records. And um, they, were, uh, they would go around and sing, and I, I just missed that. When we came to church here, it had kind of phased out, and I never had the opportunity. We kind of got up and sung every now and then just once in a blue moon, maybe every few years, but I didn't have the opportunity to sing like that. So it's a privilege that y'all get to have and that Amen. we get to hear you. Right. That's a privilege in a right. church that there's people that are wanting to sing like that. Um, I was studying today and I went outside on the uh, patio because I thought, well, I need some quietness. Well, Levi and Adeline says, we're going out with you. And so they're playing in the dirt. So I've, I've got some dirt smudges on my paper so we go back in and sit in the recliner and we're eating M&M's. So I've got M&M smudges on my paper. 
And then just sitting back there reading, Levi is drinking his juice, and I got juice on my paper. So I don't know how this is going to turn out, but um, used to when I was a single man, I'd just study, and I would just have it written out real nice and neat and crisp, and now uh, my, my handwriting is sloppy. I got M&Ms on it, and, um, but I always ask the Lord. I say, Lord, you know how it is, and you know, just if you'll just be my voice, if you'll say the words, Lord, I want to be a vessel. But I want you to turn tonight to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Hey, before we get started, I was, I was looking through my stuff. I just keep all kinds of papers. I've got old newspaper clippings, just anything that's blessed me. But I had forgotten about this old poem, One, probably my favorite poem. And it's actually been spoken here at this church many times in years past. And it's just always been a blessing to me. And this really doesn't have anything to do with my message, but I just I thought it'd be a blessing to you. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. "'What am I bid, good folks?' he cried. "'Who'll start the bidding for me? "'A dollar, a dollar two. Two dollars, and who'll make it three? It's going once, it's going twice, it's going, it's going, but no. From the room far back, an old gray-haired man came forward, and he picked up the bow. And then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening all the loose strings, he began to play a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. And finally the music ceased and the auctioneer with a voice that was quiet and low said, what am I bid now for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand, a thousand two, two thousand, now who make it three? It's three thousand once, three thousand twice, it's going, it's gone, said he. And the people cheered, but some of them cried, We do not quite understand what changed its worth. And quick came the reply, It was the touch of the Master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to this thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going. He's almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the Master's hand. I'm thankful that I was touched by the Master's hand, aren't you? It gets me every time. My grandfather used to get up here and he could rehearse it by heart over and over in his messages. Never had to look at the words like I do. Matthew chapter 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus here teaching the people. We know about the Beatitudes. He's teaching the people about matters of the heart. So many were trapped in works of the law, legalism. But Jesus is teaching that man looks on the outward appearance, but he's looking on the heart. And y'all know that things haven't changed since then. We still... Look at the outward appearance. Even for ourselves, we think, well, I've been doing such and such things. I've been reading my Bible every day. I've been doing good. But the Lord's looking deeper than that. He's looking at our heart. And that was just really uh, messing with these Pharisees and all these legalistic people. He was turning their teaching upside down. Teaching about the heart. And the key verse to this chapter, I believe, is found in verse 20. 
The key verse to the whole chapter is verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I'm sure they were looking at that thinking, how can we go any higher than this? But he wasn't talking about going higher. He was talking about going deeper. And he explains it in verse 21 and 22. He says, you've heard that it was said by them of old time, you shall not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. And here he explains what he's meaning. He's saying, but I'm telling you, it's not about the action. He's saying, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment. So he was saying, it was not about the murder. He's saying, I'm looking at your heart. And God's looking at our heart today. But I want us to look over to verse 38. That's where my message is going to be. Verse 38 of chapter 5, and I'm going to read the rest of this. Talking about relationships and interactions with one another. Talking about our old nature versus our old Adamic nature, sinful man versus the born again man. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In other words, you've heard that it's said, revenge. Whatever you do to me, I'm going to do right back to you. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. And give to him that asketh of thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn thou not away. You've heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, praise God. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Isn't he good? Yes, he is. Sends his rain. Well, we think, well, we deserve it. We don't deserve it. But he sends it on us and he sends it on the people that hate him too. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans do so? Be ye therefore perfect, or in other words, spiritually whole, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Would you bow with us for a moment of prayer? Father, thank you for the time tonight. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for touching my heart. Now, God, I just pray you'll open our hearts, that you'll open my mouth, and that you'll hide me, God, that you'll preach for me, Lord. Your Holy Spirit will do the work that I cannot do. And all you do for us, we're going to thank you. And, Lord, we pray it all in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. Key verse, verse 41 of my message tonight. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile... Go with him twain. Or in other words, go with him two miles. I want to talk about the blessing of the second mile. The blessing of the second mile. I did some studying on this a a while back. And I never knew this before. But the Romans in that time that occupied the Jewish people, they occupied other territories, they had a law. And this law said that they could order people to do their menial just tasks that they don't want to do. In other words, they could order them, hey, you carry my load. And the law was that if they ordered a Jewish boy or something to carry their load, they had to carry it one mile. And I can just imagine um, walking them... Romans walking by and telling the boy, saying, hey boy, you carry my load. And that boy probably put it on, 
And I'm sure that he probably knew the exact number of steps to walk. And when he got to that one mile marker, he dropped it. And he was done. And he wanted to do just what was required, and no doubt that's what you and I would have done as well. But Jesus is saying, if somebody asks you to go one, I want you to go above that. I want you to go two miles. Jesus says the, one, the world lives in the first mile, but I want you to live in the second mile. The second mile. Folks, I'm afraid most of the time I'm speaking to myself. Probably most people in here, we always operate on the first mile, don't we? Yeah. We only do what's required of us, and then we drop the load. All right, I've got five minutes this morning. I'm going to read my Bible. Let's see. There we go. Whew. Got it done. Yeah. That's good. I'm, I'm, I'm on day straight, 13 days that I've read my Bible. I'm doing good now. And, uh, or I'm going to get in my car and I'm turning on, I always listen to somebody preaching. All right, that's it's another day that I've listened to a sermon. I'll turn it off now. We only do what's required of yeah. us. We only love people who love us back. Yeah. When we're at the job, we do just enough that we know that we can get by with and we don't do any more. We do just enough. We do what's required of us and we don't go above. You know, that's even a, a, a worldly success thing. People, uh, people in sports, people in business, or whatever it may be, the ones that are successful, they always go above what's required. Right. I've always enjoyed sports and I've watched those athletes and I've figured it out. The ones that stand out, yes, they have talent, but usually they're the ones that work the hardest. They're the ones that got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. They're the ones that did all the practice. Uh, they went above. They went that second mile. But I'm afraid most of us operate in the first mile. But I want us to look at some ways that he's telling us to go the second mile. I want us to look at verse 38 and 39 again. You've heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. I think he's telling us to go the second mile in your forgiveness of others. Yeah. Go the second mile in your forgiveness of others. And I know this is talking about don't resist. Now, this is not talking about being a doormat. We know the Lord doesn't tolerate that. He went into the temple and he overturned when they were doing business in the temple, buying and selling, and he was angry. And he resisted what they were doing. Uh, but he's not saying that, that if somebody's coming against us, we can't defend ourselves. But he's just talking about vengeance does not belong to us. It belongs to him. And I thought if somebody tried to sue me, I thought if somebody smacked me on my right cheek, what would I do? I guarantee you my fist would be balled up, ready to go. And you, so, the same with most of y'all too. But he's saying, I want you to be different. I want you to go the second mile in your forgiveness. You know, I was thinking, we, the world we live in is angry. Uh, they call it cancel culture, what we live in now. And I hate that word. I hate it. In other words, when I think of that, I think there's no forgiveness, there's no grace. When somebody makes a mistake, they, can't, they can tell, say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, but it doesn't matter. Their careers are ruined, their reputations are ruined, and they're done with. And they're called all kinds of names, and there's absolutely no forgiveness. And I'm thinking, you know, if a man stands up and he says, I'm sorry, I was wrong 30 years ago for what I've done, and I'm sorry for that, you know, I believe a man ought to be forgiven. But in this, in this situation, uh, the Lord's telling us that we ought to go above and beyond. I'm glad God is not like that, aren't you? I'm glad that His mercies are new every morning. I want to turn to you. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but in Luke 17, verses 3 and 4, I want to read something to you. Luke 17, verses 3 and 4, and you know this well. He says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. 
And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, yeah. and seven times in a day he turns again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Yeah. Boy, you know what God's showing us? He's showing us his heart. That's right. Everything we read in his word is a reflection. He's showing us his heart. This is not Luke's idea. Luke is writing under the inspired inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. He's telling the way God is. God is saying, if I'm this way, you be that way. If you come to me, David, every day and you say, Lord, I'm sorry I did it again. Lord, I'm sorry I did it again. The Lord is saying, he means it. I'm going to forgive him. I'm glad that I know a God like that. I'm glad that he doesn't hold things against us. He's forgiving and he wants us to be forgiving like he is. Ephesians 4.32, the Bible says this. 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another. Ain't that different than today? Yes, sir. Boy, we're going to stand out in this culture if we just follow what the Lord tells us to do. Right. Be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. He's forgiven us so much, we got to be forgiving with each other, don't we? I tell you, in a room this size, how many of us, don't show of hands, but how many of us are nursing grudges that we've held a long time and we need to let go? It's not hurting other people, it's hurting us. And God is just saying, let it go. Time is short. Your life is short. Let it go. Let forgiveness just wash it away and get on to the business of serving me and loving me. We can need to go the second mile in our forgiveness of one another. Keep short accounts. Amen? Number two, he's telling us to go the second mile in our service. Go the second mile in our service. I want you to look at verse 41. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. I preached the last time here about giving the Lord first in our lives, giving Him the best in our lives. We need to be going the second mile for God. I think most of the time we come to church, and by the way, every message I preach, it's always for me. I don't know if it's for anybody else in here, but every message I study, I think the Lord's saying, David, you need that, you need to preach it. <laughs> but when we come into the church, you know what the first mile is? The first mile is coming and sitting down and enjoying the message and going home and then coming back and doing it again. Putting our tithe in the, in the offering plate. And that's good, but you know what? That's almost required. It's almost expected. That's the first mile. The second mile is when we come in and maybe we sit around and we think, you know what, I, there hadn't been anybody back in the back greeting in a number of years. I think I'd like to take that ministry. I think I'd like to go back there and be a greeter when people come in the door. And Brother Renshaw preached it this morning. He was saying, for God to come down to build His sanctuary with us, if we want to get close to God, it's going to cost us something. Amen. Service to God should cost us something. That's it ought to be something that we lay down on that sacrifice on that altar and say, Lord, that's costing me time. It's costing me some money. But if it doesn't cost anything, is it worth anything? We need to do something that costs us for the Lord. We need to go that second mile for God. Work as unto the Lord. God asked Moses in Exodus, I think, chapter 2 or 4, Moses, was com he was worried. He told him to go into Pharaoh because he was going to let his people go. And Pharaoh was complaining, saying, I can't do that. And I think the Lord got fed up and he said, Moses, what is in your hand? And Moses said, a rod. And he said, throw it on the ground. And he threw it on the ground and it immediately became a serpent. And, and I've heard that preached. And I, the Lord is asking us, David, what's in your hand? Because many of us say, Lord, I can't preach. I can't sing. I can't play the piano. But God is asking each one of us, what's in your hand? What can you do? I've, I've said this, y'all know it, but if I couldn't do anything, if this yard wasn't being mowed out here, I think what I'd do to serve the Lord, I'd love, because something that I love to do is to mow 
and to sweep and to blow off sidewalks. I like to make, I probably should have been a farmer and I wasn't. And so mowing things is just something that I enjoy. And I think that I would like to come out here and just to take care of the place so it looks nice for people to come into church. That's something that I could give to the Lord. Right. That's something that I could do. That's something that was in my hand to do. What's in your hand that you can serve the Lord with? What spiritual gift that you, do you have? Now, I, I believe that's something that's been neglected in the teaching of the church is trying to help people figure out what their spiritual gift right. is. Most of the time, it's going to be something that you're pretty good at that you kind of like to do, too. Most of the time, because God gives you things that you are sort of gravitate towards. But we need to find what our spiritual gift is and get on with the business of serving God. Are you an encourager? Well, get on with the business of encouraging people. Are you good at hospitality? Do you like to cook? Do you like to have people in your home? We get on with the business of getting people in and being a blessing to them, opening up your home, uh, cooking for people, serving them a meal, being a blessing. Uh, let that be your service to the Lord. What is it that you can do? And I've said it before, Miss Dot Johnson, who comes on Sunday morning, she wasn't here this morning, sat back here, lives out in the big woods, and she used to cook all the time. She'd cook pies and things. And if anybody, there was a death or sickness, she was always bringing food. That was what she could do. And I'll tell on Brother Leroy, he don't remember this, but years ago, me and him were on the bus going somewhere. I don't remember, but uh, we were riding along and I'll never forget it, Brother Leroy. He told me, he said, David, I can't do much, but I can drive this bus and I can pick up these kids. <laughs> What's in your hand that you can do? It doesn't have to be big if God is in it. Amen. It doesn't have to be big. Number three, go the second mile in your giving. Go the second mile in your giving. Look at verse 42. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Be a giver. God is a giver. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for his hall, how shall he not freely give us all things? For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only begotten son. Does any man lack wisdom? Let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally. God is a giver. What are we? What am I? I'm a taker. Most of the time, I'm a taker. I like when people give to me. I like to receive. But you know what we were talking about? Giving costs you something. Yes. Giving will cost you. Y'all think about it. It's rare to meet somebody that will just come up to you. Usually mothers are like this, though. I'm going to say this about mothers. Out of the blue, somebody will come up to you and say, David, I was out in town today, and I saw something I thought of you, and I bought it for you. And that just blows me away because I'll be honest, my mind doesn't work that way. When I'm out shopping, I'm thinking of what I need or what I would like, and then I get it and go home. And I'd say most men are like that. But it's rare to find that person that's thinking about other people when they're out buying things, when they're out doing their things, and their mind is on other people. They're givers. And this is the heart of God. He says that, uh, that you'll do this, that you may be the children of your Father. In other words, that you're going to be like Him because He's a giver. He's a giver. I'll never forget, every time I see this verse, verse 42, give to Him that asketh thee, I never will forget it. Many years ago, probably 30 years ago, I was with my friend working at his church. And it was a Saturday, and we were working out in the shrubs, and uh, he, he, he knew I liked landscaping, and we were working. And this old car pulled up, and um, a young woman, probably in her mid-twenties, got out. I, I noticed the car seat was in the back of the seat, and it was a hot day. Uh, she got out, and, you know, I could tell she had lived a rough life, but her car was sort of rattling, and, you know... She, she had probably had just a rough time of it. And she got out and she said, uh, I was wondering if y'all, I'm about out of gas. Would y'all have any gas money? Well, you know, there's people that I know take advantage of 
people like that. I know that. And some people just want the money for bad purposes. But I could sense it. I could sense she was telling the truth. And I said, well, ma'am, I don't have any money on me. But I said, let me, I know that the preacher and his wife are in that church. And I said, let me ask my friend. And um, uh, so went in there. And uh, he came back and he said, she's going to ask the preacher. And so we kind of went back to work and she just waited there. And just a moment, the door opened up and the, the lady put her head out and looked at us and went like this. And I don't know why, but it was up to me. I went back to that girl, I guess because I was the first one that talked to her. And I said, ma'am, and I, I got my wallet out. And I said, ma'am, I think they must just not have money right now. And I said, if I had it, I would give it to you too. And I don't have it. And I closed it and I put it and she was just so gracious. She said, that's okay. She said, I'll, I'll make it. I'll find somebody else. And I got, she got in her car and she left and I never saw her again. More than likely, she went down the road and somebody that doesn't know the Lord was glad to give her money. Is probably what happened. And we lost our testimony. Um, but I think I went home that night, and that verse stood out to me. Give to him that asketh, and from him that would borrow, they don't turn them away. Do you have something that you can give? I've heard of people that if you walk into their house, just people that are free with their possessions, if you just say, hey, I like that, and they'll say, take it, it's yours. That's just the way they are. It doesn't have a hold on them. They're willing to give it away for the Lord. We need to be able to let loose and give God, give Him our time. Give Him our talents. Give Him our offerings. Yep. Yep. You know, the Lord talked yep. about in the Old Testament giving the tithe. Now, the tithe generally represents 10%. But y'all know what? We should give the tithe. But you know, the, the tithe already belongs to Him. Amen. The tithe is the first mile. Amen. It's required. The second mile goes above the tithe. How are we living with our time and our talents and our treasures? Are we living in the first mile or are we living in the second mile? But I will tell you all something. The blessing is always in the second mile. The blessing is always in the second mile. Luke 6, 38. I want to turn. I know time is moving on, but Luke 6. I'm in Matthew. Luke 6, 38. The Lord says this, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together. Running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, withal it shall be measured to you again. Now most people, until I started studying this, most people apply that only to money. But if you read the whole context there, it's not talking about money. Now, you can apply it, but that's not what all it's talking about. Yeah. Look at verse 36. Be therefore merciful as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. The Lord is saying, if you'll give, if you'll give mercy, it's going to come back to you. If you don't judge, if you don't condemn, that's going to come back to you. Whatever, if you offer forgiveness, forgiveness is going to come back to you. And it's going to be good measure. It's going to be pressed down and shaken together. Now, I always think about this. You remember in um, Ruth, they were out there and Ruth was gleaning in the field. There was always two harvesters in fields in those days in the Old Testament. There was the... Regular harvesters that were going through the fields, and then there was the poor that were gleaning from the sides of the fields. Now, you know that the people that were just out there getting paid by the hour, they were filling up their baskets, and then they'd go put it down. They'd go get another basket. No big deal to them. But the poor that were gleaning from the corners of the fields, they probably had walked a long way. They probably didn't have, they probably had one basket. And this determined how much the money they would have, how much food their family would have. And I'm sure they were packing it in there. They were shaking it. They were pressing it, shaking it some more, then putting it in. They might even stomp on it, getting it down, and then putting more in it. The Lord is saying, if you'll give, it'll come back to you. 
If you'll give like this, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. That's how if we give like that, God is going to give back to us. But that's always used, I know, to talk about offerings, and it can be. But if you'll look through all that, the Lord is talking all about... Uh, it says, do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. Most of us, when we let somebody borrow something, we think, I better get that back. <laughs> I better have that back. I want to be the kind of person that says, you keep that. I want to get to that point. Because God will give it back. He'll give it back to us if we need it. He'll give it back to us. You know, folks, I guess that's about all I have. But I want you to think about something as we... As we um, close, and Miss Phyllis, wherever you're at, or somebody, could y'all play the piano? This first law, uh, this first mile, is for the law. It's required. But the second mile is for love. The first mile is because you have to, but listen to this, the second mile... Is because you want to. And I'm afraid, folks, I don't want to get to heaven. I don't want to get to heaven. I don't know what it's going to be like, but I don't want to stand before him and to think, you know what? I always went the first mile. I never went the second. I always did what I had to. Lord, I never did what you wanted me to. I never, I did it because it was required, not because it was out of love. How are you doing in your life? Are you living in the first mile or the second mile? God help us to live in the second mile, amen. If God has spoken to you, you feel free to come pray. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that first mile is the Old Testament law. That second mile is the law of Christ. I hear so many times, I don't under the law. And as far as the Old Testament law, they're right. But you ain't from underneath Christ's law. You ain't. 
something. God requires nothing from you that he didn't do himself. Nothing. In the Old Testament law, there's nothing but emptiness and death because we're failures. The law of Christ is life, liberty, peace. You ever want to know God's grace and God's goodness and God's peace? Get in that second mile. Amen. Amen. I've seen people, I've watched people be the Old Testament Christian. That first mile, and they leave empty. I've watched poor, beat up, beat down, whooped up on Christians walk that second mile. And they walk out happy. They walk out blessed. <laughs> Amen. Brother David, I believe you had the message. Amen. Amen. Church don't never, never, ever, ever get satisfied in your walk with the Lord where you're at. There's more ground to be won. There's more ground to be taken. Man, it's going to take a willing heart. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you for being here tonight. Message convicted me. I want to keep going because you, you, when you get under conviction, you just you meditate, or I do. I meditate on it. And, uh, but I need to quit and let the Holy Ghost keep with y'all. Desire to want more this year, this week. This week. Don't 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 think next year, next month. This week. We get too far strung out there, we quit this week. Ask the Lord, ask the Lord to put one person, one tomorrow that you can witness to, that you can go that second mile with. Just one, just one. Again, don't go into the big numbers, you'll get defeated. Just one. Just one. Let's see what the Lord will do with the church and with, with me. Lord, tonight I thank you for the preached word. I thank you, Lord, for the heart that was in it. I, I thank you, Lord, for the tenderness. But Lord, allow, help me to allow the Holy Ghost to keep twisting the screws in my heart. Lord, that I might be able to be more like you. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person that's been here today. Thank you, Lord, for the visitors that's been here. Bless them, God. Touch them, strengthen them, encourage them. Lord, as Brother DeRussia goes off and preaches, uh, Lord, he asks for prayer for his ministry. Lord, I pray, God, that as he stands behind the pulpit, Lord, that you'd let the power of God rest on him. And Lord, as he's going about his business and his day-to-day, -day, Help him be a light and a witness. God, I pray that you would allow people to see the Holy Ghost rest on him. Lord, I pray that as the church walks out the door, Lord, that they see the field that it's white, ready to harvest. Lord, that they go around and testify about all the things you've done for them. Lord, help them to be able to talk about the goodness of God. Lord, search us tonight. Show us the things where we've come up short. We sure want to tell you, Lord, we love you and we thank you. Let tomorrow be a day, a good day for you to come back. Lord, it'd be good to see you. But if not, help me, Lord, to be busy. Lord, I, I, I want to thank you and I want to praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, anything that we need to...